Candy Mossett is a Mandan Hidatsa Arikara warrior mother from the Fort Berthold Reservation in South Dakota. She says she does not fit inside any box or under any label. She says she's made of circles, that she is a human being. But to the native and non-native peoples who come across her message in person or on the front lines of Standing Rock, Candy Mossett is a celebrated warrior for taking a stand against the fossil fuel industry, drug cartels, and sex trafficking on her reservation. But if you ask her, she's just a mom and a water protector. Candy first joined the Bioneers Indigenous Forum in 2014 when she was invited to present alongside Tom Goldtooth, the executive director of the Indigenous Environmental Network and co-founder of the Indigenous Forum. As the panel mediator, I didn't know who she was at the time. Who's Candy Mossett, I asked Tom, just before the program was about to start. He pointed to a young woman in shorts and a t-shirt pushing a baby stroller. Just as Candy Mossett was about to go on stage, she quietly whispered to her toddler, can you be a good girl and stay with auntie while I give my talk? With that, Candy stepped up on stage and sat down next to Tom. Any notions that this unassuming, soft-spoken woman was just a mom from the res among the audience was totally disabused when Candy began to share her story. Candy was prepared with a battle cry from the res. Candy silenced the room with firsthand accounts of the impacts of fracking on her reservation, the place where she grew up and where she was now raising her young daughter. Candy also shared about the indirect effects of fracking on her community. She talked frankly about the underground mafia that provides drugs and traffics native girls to service fossil fuel industry workers living in temporary man camps. And when the men are done using them, these young women, daughters, sisters, mothers, are reduced to just another missing and murdered indigenous woman statistic. Candy helped us to truly understand what it feels like to live in the midst of fracking. To the fossil fuel industry, Native peoples living on the reservation are throwaway people. Candy broke our hearts that day. We left the indigenous forum in collective disbelief and sadness over what Candy had witnessed in her short lifetime. But along with a deeply disturbing portrait of the devastating impacts of fracking on a community, somehow Candy also imparted hope. Her courage is contagious. Less than two years later, Candy became an international environmental celebrity when she joined the Sacred Stone Camp early in the Standing Rock demonstrations against the Dakota Access Pipeline. Many people are, aware, are unaware that the No Dapple movement grew out of a group of Native women who gathered in the spring of 2016 to pray over the pipeline as it came closer and closer to the sacred waters of the Cannonball River. That summer, thousands of Native Americans from North America and around the world tuned into Candy Mossett's Facebook Live accounts of what was happening on the ground at Standing Rock. She became a trusted source for people in Indian country to understand what was going on at Standing Rock minute by minute. She asked for prayers and we prayed. She generously left the camp for a few days along with fellow frontline water protectors Dallas Goldtooth and Tara Hauska last year to offer an update on the 2016 Bioneers main stage. The video went viral with over a million views. So when Tom Goldtooth finds a beautiful voice in Indian country, chances are he's heard their battle cry and he wants the world to hear it with him. When I first joined the Bioneers community, Tom advised me not just to invite academics to the Indigenous Forum, but to make sure we included people with voice and heart from the res. Armed with an MA in environmental management, Candy is both and so much more. She is made of infinite circles of life, hope and courage unlike anyone I have ever met. She's a warrior mom. Out of all the people I've met in my life, she is the most amazing. And like any great leader, she's so humble. Please join me in welcoming my hero, Candy Mossett. Back there, I'm not gonna cry. <laughs> it's gonna 
to mess up my makeup that they make us put on. <laughs> so, um, Dosha, Marigut, Marishima A Ishuia Hets. And so in my Hiradza language, I said, hello, relatives. My name is Eagle Woman. My English name is Candy Mossett. And I um, wanted to talk to you a little bit about um, where I come from the Mandan, Hiradza, Rikra Nations in North Dakota, which were three separate and distinct tribes that were put together on the same reservation in 1860 by this federal government because we were similar enough. And also, so many of us were decimated by smallpox that we were really small in numbers by the time that happened. <clears throat> but we have our separate languages and cultures and traditions. We're earth lodge dwelling tribes. It's not like the Western movies where you see teepees and horses and buffalo and that's it, <laughs> you know. Um, we had those things for sure, but we were farming tribes. We grew corn, squash, beans, tobacco, and as such, always lived along the waterways and the bottomlands, the Missouri River, for a really, really, really long time. So one of the first threats after the reservation in 1860 was something called the Flood Control Act of 1944, also known as the Pick Sloan Act, where they came up with this brilliant idea to build a series of dams along the Missouri River. And incidentally, every single one of those is below a reservation, flooded us. And that dam, the Garrison Dam, created our reservoir of Lake Sakakawea, which we have come to embrace as our waterway, as, we're, as our lifeblood. But we also had a moment where we were forced into a cash economy then as a result. My grandma says it's like we were forced through a door and could never look back again. We had to go to the top lands because that dam flooded all of our class one and class two agricultural lands on the bottom lands and all of the towns and villages that we had to come to accept that were forced upon us by the federal government. By the time our chairman at the time, George Gillette, signed on to that deal, he cried because they were already $60 million into building that project by the time we agreed to do it. So then, North Dakota was like, oh, well we have this lig lignite coal here. It's a beautiful thing, which it's not. Lignite coal is the dirtiest coal that you could possibly imagine. That comes from North Dakota. Seven coal-fired power plants, several mines that we have impacting our air that has been happening for a very long time. I remember going to the coal plants in seventh grade. Our whole class fit into the back of a shovel, uh, one shovel that they used to dig it up. And um, they were telling us about how great it was, you know, how we could get jobs in the coal industry and it was going to be a wonderful thing. And I remember I was like, I'm too cool to wear these goggles that they gave us. And I took them off and I was like, oh crap, there's like all these particles going into my eyes. So I put them back on. But they didn't tell us about what it was doing to our watersheds. They didn't tell us that every single bit of our over 11,000 miles of rivers, lakes, and streams in North Dakota would eventually be contaminated with mercury as a result of that industry. That is before the fracking you may have heard of. This is all before we have the nation's only commercial scale coal gasification plant. We have uranium mining. We have over 8,000 acres of underground nuclear warheads stored in North Dakota. Okay, and then enter fracking and the Bakken shale formation that exists where I'm from. They call my reservation the sweet spot because at least one-fifth of the oil that comes out of there comes from under our feet. And so instead of seeing fields, we started seeing these popping up all over the place. Rigs everywhere. And on my reservation, there's no setbacks. Zero. They're right behind apartment buildings where children ride their bikes and play. So we see these things that say, for sale, industrial zoned, lease to the industry. North Dakota is full of sunflowers, as my daughter is showing you here. We have wheat, canola, corn, barley, oats. We're known as the breadbasket of the country. And yet, this is what the wheat fields are starting to look like. This one was four years ago, and it's still not cleaned up because the spill was so toxic in this wheat field, which this farming family hopes to be able to put into production again. We started seeing truck traffic coming into my community and just tearing up our roads. Roads that actually used to be roads are now just gravel 
and nobody's fixing them. State of North Dakota is not because we're sovereign nations. These trucks take liberties. They fill up their frack trucks with pristine water where our families use to fill up their cisterns, families that have to haul water. So the next person that comes along has no idea whatever flowback was in that truck. This is Main Street, Newtown, North Dakota, a little tiny town where I grew up, 1,500 people in my community until the oil boom. Boom, all of a sudden, 5,000 people, probably three times as many trucks. They dump those frack fluids, toxic, never again used for human, animal, any consumption, right onto the roads, because they can get away with it in Indian country. Whenever there's an accident, traffic gets backed up for miles and miles, and hopefully, hopefully people aren't hurt. But sometimes, this is my uncle's truck. He was moving my cousin. Him and my brother were riding. A semi decided they were going to take over the whole road, and they either had to hit the ditch or have a head-on collision with the semi. They hit the ditch. And they were OK. They had cuts, bruises, scrapes. Not everybody is always so lucky. In 2008, when I really started fighting back against this industry, it was because I had a friend who was killed by those semis, and she was 23 years old, literally crushing her. Nothing was ever done. And since that time, over 40 people in my community have died just running on the road, taking their kids to school. That is some of the social. What about environmental? This spill in 2014 still hasn't been cleaned up. We live in the Badlands in North Dakota. It's not all flat like some people might think. We have beautiful areas called the Badlands, and they tell us time and again that it's not getting into the water when spills happen. Don't worry about that frack water when it touches stuff. It's not that toxic. They said, the EPA and others, that this is clean. There's still heavy mercury, heavy metals, heavy toxins, arsenic sitting on top of the soil from 2014, and it's cleaned up. They tell us, don't worry when there's a spill, because we're going to have these sandbags here that are going to take care of everything. It's not going to get into Lake Sakakawea. Well, this was taken out of Lake Sakakawea when my sister was swimming. This water came out of the lake, and so I took it to the North Dakota State Health Department, charged $200 out of my own pocket, you know, to pay to see what the heck this was. And they're like, oh, don't worry, it's a blue-green algae bloom. I was like, okay, what does that mean? It's toxic. You're not supposed to be swimming in it. You're not supposed to drink it. This was taken one mile from our water intake plant for our community. In addition to the water, our air is being polluted. How many of you have been to North Dakota? Raise your hands. How many big, huge cities like New York have you seen in North Dakota? None. <laughs> because there aren't any. So this circle that you're looking at is not from the lights like you see in the eastern part of the country there. It's from the flares. You can literally stand in one area and do a 360 and feel like you're in a war zone. I can't tell you how hard it is to be home with my daughter in the back seat. And I don't even want us to have to breathe. But we don't have a choice. So we thought, <laughs> we're going to fight back against this industry. Because look at this. Just a few years ago, you could see for miles and see the buttes. All of the compounds that are in there, all I wanted you to notice about this was where the little red arrows are, because those are carcinogenic, which means cancer causing. As a cancer survivor who shouldn't even be standing here today because I was diagnosed with a stage four sarcoma tumor when I was 20 years old, this is really triggering to me. And this is just 652 of the 2,000 possible chemicals that can be in that frack water. And every single one of those is of concern. They don't care where they put these things. My grandmother used to fast here. She used to go out and collect June berries, ground berries, choke cherries, turnips. And now signs say, do not enter. You cannot be here. And then came the man camps. Did you know that this past nine months alone, there were close to 100 people that were rescued from the sex trafficking industry? The youngest one was three months old. Crime came with the industry. 
It's inevitable. These are just headlines I took from my local papers that you're not going to see in mainstream media. Every single one of these has a story I don't have enough time to share with you today, but imagine the worst thing that used to happen when I was little was that the bad kids, us, used to egg our teachers' houses on Halloween. <laughs> that was the crime in our community. And now this. And with that came drugs, came heroin, something we never had in our community before. And when people got addicted on heroin, the industry, the, the police, the, oh, they're just druggies. There was no services for the people. So when people like Ashley got addicted to heroin, there was nowhere for her to turn. She laid in a hospital bed for three days while her hands turned black and her feet turned black while her internal organs shut down before she died at 28. In the last year, we buried Lisa. Same thing, no one to turn to because she was just a druggie. No, she was a person that left behind five children. My cousin Daniel went missing. In 2013, we knew that he was with MS-13, a known organized gang crime that originated out of Venezuela. We knew that the night he went missing, he was with those kind of people. So we searched and searched for Daniel for months, and we found him in Lake Sakakuya under the bridge. <laughs> And because there was no stab wounds, there was no gunshot wounds, it was open and shut. We never knew, and we'll probably never know who killed Daniel. And that happens all the time as a result of the oil industry. And what do we get? What's our thanks for allowing these people to come into our communities? Written on our dumpsters for our kids to find? Racism as if it's our fault that they're there. So we fought against the semis, we fought against the trains. Because then that bright idea was to bring these bomb trains and send them out all over the country. And it hurt every time one of those blew up because they came from my community. In Canada, 47 people were killed, including two kids under the age of five when one of these trains blew up. And so then, what was the next brainchild? Pipelines. You've probably heard of the Dakota Access Pipeline. You might know how it ended at the time. Yeah, we were forced out by gunpoint from our US military for trying to protect our water. When we say the front lines, People get triggered because they say, oh, that connotates war. Well, if you don't think we're at war, then you're sorely mistaken and you need to wake up because we are on the front lines. We stood there with our sage and our sweet grass and our medicine against armed military to protect water and tell people water is life. And it doesn't matter that the camp physically was forced out because they can never take away the fires that are burning in our hearts from that. And we're never going to quit. We are going to continue to fight because it's not just about one pipeline. Raise your hand if you heard of Dakota Access. Okay, now raise your hand if you've heard of Sagagawea pipeline. Hmm. That one quietly went under the water at the same time. You see, it's not just about the symptoms. It's about stopping it at the source. And I want to show this video of what we're continuing to do at home. So three years ago was the first time that we had gotten our Mandan, Hiradza, and Arikara Nation elders and representatives together in 20 years that were together to do a water blessing.
You know, these industries, their roots aren't here. They're only here for the money, and they want to extract as fast as they can. And we have a lot that's at stake here. There's a big battle going on right now, and we're the battlefield. What we're doing here is bringing folks from all over uh, the United States and making sure that people understand that the legacy here, the legacy of extraction, ultimately goes in downstream towards other communities in the United States, especially in the South. So making those connections from the extraction point through the pipelines, you know, all of the processing, the refinement, um, and how we're in the struggle together. I think it's just really important to bring people together and understand we're not alone when it comes to these extractive industries and how they're impacting us. And the whole message of the day is just keep it in the ground, stop it at the source, and then all of those negative symptoms that negatively impact everybody else won't have to happen. Right? <laughs> it seems like common sense to me. <laughs> Just because you don't see us in the media fighting at Standing Rock doesn't mean we went away and that we're not going to continue to fight in the Bakken. You can bet that we're in our communities fighting and pushing back. We're making those truck drivers feel uncomfortable when we put our signs up telling them that we don't want them there. We're going to continue to bring people to North Dakota and to continue to have these toxic tours, just like this one we just had this past August, to show that the symptom, the pipeline is still there, but we're going to fight to stop it there because fracking is a problem in this country. It's also a problem worldwide, and that's just one of the problems of the fossil fuel industry that exists, that threatens life. Mini Wachoni is so much more than just a slogan or a saying. Water of life is literally when we're pregnant, we carry our babies in that water. And in, in, in that moment, <laughs> that moment when you understand what that means is so powerful. And I like to share it with people because we have a responsibility to protect that life to show them that they can be the future power shifters and to get them ready to do it. Because these things take a really long time, but we're strong and we're smart. And we know that we can do things like decolonize our own minds. Yes, you can. Look up Dr. Michael Yellowbird. I don't have time to go into the whole thing right now, but neuro decolonization through mindfulness you watch one of his things, poof. yeah, it's, it's amazing. That's what we can do as individuals if we want to right the wrongs in the world. Sure, renewable energy is great. It is good to have those things. It is good to transition, but that's not what's going to save us. We have to get to the very heart of the problem of this broken system, which is capitalism and colonization. We need to do it, and we can. You can get the book if you're not indigenous. I don't know how much sense it'll make, but it's pretty good. It explains what that means. Don't be afraid of decolonization. It can be as simple as planting a garden. Honestly, start there. Our little kids, our children should be allowed to continue our culture and practice our way of life. This is one of our earth lodges and a modern day spin that we're building in our community right now. Because our country, our world is addicted to oil. We have to admit it. We have to admit the foundation that we're built on is a bad foundation. And it has to crumble so that we can rebuild it. If we have to go to D.C. and leave our communities and march and, and say, hey, number 45, you're insane, and we're going to do everything we can to get you out, then we will. Yes. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid and don't sit on your couch and wait for somebody else to decolonize your own mind because you're the only one that can decolonize your own mind. I'm sorry, but you have to do some homework. Please support the Dakota Resource Council who supports our local Fort Berthold Power Group. Please don't forget about the people on the ground. Dakota Resource Council is in North Dakota trying to do good things and they need support. And please support us at the Indigenous Environmental Network because it's for the next seven generations. 
If not us, who? If not now, when? We can do this, people. We can do it together. Matsi Gidards, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. So last year when Candy came down from Standing Rock and, and spoke with a couple of other folks with Dallas and um, Tara Hauska, as uh, someone mentioned this morning, that video, we got it out really quickly and got over a million views. So we're going to be doing even more of that. This is what this needs to get out to everybody. So thank you for being here and seeing it first.